Hello and welcome to Green Market Outlook Week uh, for 2020. So this is a little bit different to, to the usual format where we would all um, be down in London and uh, this would be a, a seminar session on stage. So we're recording today, um, as you can see, an estimated cost of production and uh, a little bit of forward planning and budgeting, which we've been doing um, with our two guests that were joined today. Um, so I am Chris Leslie, uh, Cereals and Oil Seeds Knowledge Exchange Manager. We're joined by Mark Topliff, uh, who is the farm economics uh, chat with us. And we've got Mark McCallum, um, who is a farmer from St. Martin's in the Black Isle. Need to point out the Black Isle part there, very important. And also chairman of Hyle and Grain. And uh, David Fuller Shapcott, who is also uh, an arable farmer from the Scottish Borders, which is most definitely not in the Black Isles, so polar opposites of Scotland. Uh, so welcome to you guys. Um, today we're going to um, go through a, a slideshow um, and we'll be discussing uh, the key input trends and prices uh, from the years that we have available on FarmBench from 2017 to 2020. Um, and that from this, Mark has managed to pull out the estimated national cost of production. Uh, and from that, we'll have a little discussion about what this means looking forward. So I'll hand over now um, to Mark and uh, we'll, we'll kick off. Thanks, Chris. And uh, hello, everybody. So we're good to start, as, as Chris mentioned, to look at the, the key input price trends that we've seen uh, over the last uh, three years or so, um, just to give some context in terms of where some of these price trends have been. Um, so I've picked out uh, five, five key ones there, seeds, fuel, fertilisers, uh, fungicides and herbicides. Um, so um, in terms of seeds to start with, um, Generally, these these are uh, the price trends which DEFRA uh, publish, uh, so they're an index, and uh, we've seen with that price trend very little change really uh, over the last few years. Um, if you look at fuel, it's been much more volatile. Um, we've seen uh, sort of increases in the last few years, but this year, uh, due to the uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, we saw demand for uh, oil uh, drop significantly, and that's obviously impacted on on red diesel prices uh, as well. Uh, although we've seen some pickup uh, just just recently. Um, in terms of uh, fertilisers, um, uh, very similar. Um, there's there's some linkage between the two because obviously the uh, the price uh, of fertilisers is linked to the the cost of production of those things and. Uh, uh, oil prices is one of those influences. So we we saw uh, we saw fertilizer prices also sort of dip this year, uh, reduction in in demand actually in some in some cases, uh, but also the reduction in cost production as well. Um, fungicides is the interesting one. We've seen some uh, changes in the the chemicals which are have been sort of withdrawn and can't be used, and so we've seen some increases in in the remaining fungicide products which are out there in the market and particularly this year uh, we've seen that withdrawal of the CTL uh, chemical and so the, the remaining products are, uh, are more expensive and so we've seen this increase in the in the price of fungicides. Uh, but herbicides uh, generally have been fairly steady over the last few years so uh, not a great deal of change there, we're not seeing too much of a change at the moment. So uh, just just bringing in Chris, Mark, and, and David. I mean, are those are sort of trends that uh, reflect what you've seen with with your businesses and, and put, buying those inputs in. It's uh, it's certainly very interesting to to see it uh, on the screen in front of you. I mean, the fungicide uh, change there. Uh, so that's in that's cost of fungicide used on farm. So that's the price of the the actual fungicide products. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, used on farm, and that's a weighted. Uh, average of the fungicides used as well. So uh, it's uh, depending on which products are used most, it'll be weighted more to those than, than those that are used the least. It does show the significant jump, isn't it? In the end of November there, we'll be starting to get the new chemistry that's replacing some of the chemistry that's now no longer available, e.g. CTL. And really, the, that'll be, an, I suspect that won't come down. No. That, that has to be an increasing trend. You can't see that, uh, you know, we are due to lose more and more products. Um, so you can only see that line increasing. It might stay fairly flat, but I can't see it coming back to those, that free level. I, I, I'd be very surprised. 
it, it looks to me uh, uh, highly surprising that you could have, if, if we're on an index uh, basis where 100, 100 is, a, is a no change over the years, to have a 40% change uh, just on the basis of CTL, that seems a little surprising to me. It looks like a lot. On the back of a dirty year, maybe? Uh, maybe, but but it's it's still I mean, that's a, it's not been that particularly dirty. I wouldn't have thought, but but I mean, that's nearly a forty percent, a uh, 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 forty index rise um, in, in this season alone. I find mm -hmm. that a little bit surprising, given that CTL was still available at the beginning of the season too. I suppose it, when you look at it, so David, timing wise, would a lot of it, you know, you have the purchase of the CTL. Um, mm -hmm. which was advanced purchase. And then I suppose I'm just thinking off the top of my head here that actually if some of that wasn't used and then you had to react to it, you, you know, you might have purchased more chemicals. So, the, um, you, you know, there might have been a bit of advanced purchase and they're putting it as mm. polite as possible. Mm -hmm. um, for it, which... You're right, though. It's a massive jump. And it it's cannot... a scary jump, actually. And, and, and I do wonder, from my own business, I don't think I saw that jump. I mean, I think if anything, we used less this year. We had a slightly more favourable year, but, you know, if that's a trend, it's massive. Yeah, this is, I mean, just to clarify, this is just the price of the product rather than the uh, uh, the cost, so uh, the, the quantity used. So uh, um, so I think the definitely variation depending on, um, yeah, yeah the, what quantity of those products are used uh, on farm this season. More interesting to really see that the rest is not, yes, it swings, but actually, it's not that big. There's not huge big change changes in, in those prices. And, um, well, I mean, you, you generally think the fuel, the fertilizer, the gas uh, is all linked, don't you? Which it kind of, mm. uh, you know, for the skeptics amongst us that, you know, it kind you of is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, it, you know, it is all, always good to, to point that, to, to see that uh, on screen in front of us, isn't it? So we've got seeds there, which seems to be fairly flat, but reports are coming in that uh, seed prices are certainly uh, going up at the moment. So is that is that what you you all experience at the moment? I, I mean, I would suggest we've had maybe a twenty pound a ton increase in seed costs. You know, to mm -hmm. buy from the merchant. I think I'm trying to think. It was roughly about three seventy three eighty a ton last year, and it will be up over four hundred this year. Would that be fair? Uh, that would be right, Chris. But of course, your base price for the for the uh, uh, seed is set on what the market is doing, and the market's yeah. risen too. So I, I don't. I mean, I don't. As a as an index, sit, seeing seed sitting at a hundred uh, doesn't surprise me because we would be uh, as a relative figure. It's not going to change relative to the value of grain at the other end, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Uh, and fuel. I mean, that came down significantly this year um certainly some of the figures i've seen it's dropped something 20 25 pence a litre um but uh, slightly picking up as uh, that uh, demand for oil has, has also started to increase i mean looking forward i think that's going to be influenced by how the so covid 19 pandemic sort of works out really uh, over the next few months um and uh, but i think it might keep fairly subdued um, i think demand will still be lower than what it was at the start of the year um, how, 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 do, how do you guys sort of feel about that? I mean, fuel's a difficult one, isn't it? Because, you know, if you need it, you need it. Um, you've got to buy it. So it's, uh, you know, and then you have to have tanks and storage and capacity um, to, to look at any other way around it. But, uh, I, I mean, absolutely good to see fuel coming down. It's, uh, it, does, it does start to, to creep up when, you know, when you look at the average horsepower per farm or, um, horsepower per hectare figures, uh, you know, you've got to feed these machines somehow, mm. don't you? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting one to try and to try and work out. And a lot of people will be forward buying fuel, I suppose, to try and mitigate the risk of uh, the volatility in the market that you see there. Other than trying to sort of forward buy, are there any other sort of strategies you can use to try and reduce that fuel, fuel usage? Or is it you've just got to use what you've got to use? Is a bit of got to use what you've got to use. You can forward buy, but it's always factored in too. I mean, I forward bought for this harvest, but it ended up being roughly where the price was. So clearly, mm. you know, that's how the fuel companies will factor it in. They know that far out what the price will be, or they'll factor it in. So unless you get something like COVID coming along, 
which really changes the supply demand dynamics there's they can probably factor it in so it's more of a hedge than a mm. Mm. i suppose it's putting some certainty into the job isn't it that's all it's doing it, it is it doesn't make it cheap or expensive it just you know where you're at mm. yeah and a lot of people will be monitoring fuel on farm as well as to, to operations and passes so you know, I think the days of recreational tillage have, have potentially passed, um, but then you do have to react to the weather, which ultimately will increase fuel usage, I'd suggest, including the grain drying as well. Mm. Fertilisers, we've seen the price of fertilisers uh, come down this year, um, and that's certainly influenced the, the estimated costings, which we'll, we'll show later. Um, but again, reports of those fertiliser prices start to creep up again. Yeah, there is certainly a bit there in the market, isn't it? You know, the, the, the usual one, there's always a dip the toe in the water, comes out August, September time, um, just to see where it goes. And that, you know, you sometimes would think that's used to set the price uh, as it goes on. But, um, you, you know, supply, getting it into the country is usually the, the, the big price driver, isn't it? And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that runs throughout the winter. Uh, a lot of people will have forward bought, I would imagine. Um, for next year and quite a few people looking towards liquid um, you know which will be encompassed in that which ultimately is m more expensive uh, th than the bagged stuff so y you know you can see an increase <coughs> um, in that and then if the urea um, is going to be uh, banned or reduced then that will obviously have an impact as well I would have thought you've got to move to something else haven't you mm. yeah, absolutely so I mean the impact of that in terms of costs of production for for growers across the country will vary obviously depending on the amount they use of these products uh, and the type of season they've had but um it's it's something which is probably quite prudent to keep an eye on isn't it to to help with that budgeting and we'll, we'll talk about sort of forward planning later um, so i think probably the message is you know don't lose sight of what these what these input prices are doing really um, I'll go on to the next slide, which is uh, now sort of looking at what the, the 2019 uh, figures showed in terms of cost of production for, for winter wheat. Um, and I've broken this down by, by cost categories, you can see there. Uh, what I've also done is sort of split those into the performance groups. So the costs which we saw in the top and bottom 25% and the middle 50%. Um, just for those listening, just to say why, uh, how we've ranked those those performance groups. It's all based on net margin. So you, again, your income from the crop minus your, your variable and fixed costs. Um, uh, and so that net margin is the uh, the ranking used to whether you're in the top or bottom or in the middle. So here we see that you know for for wheat, the, the five big cost areas of fertilizer, crop protection, labor, machinery equipment, and, and the rental value. Uh, of land um does that does that surprise you at all or is there anything there which you think no actually that's probably what we expect nothing surprises me there how is a rental value can you explain more how that is is that mm. like um if you own or if you own it's the cost of the land can you explain that a bit more mark yeah so um, it'll be if you rent land you see actual rent yeah. value if you own the land then it's putting a rental value on it um, and that will be the local price for that that land um, and what it does it then means that everybody is put on the same basis for when you're doing this sort of comparison of figures um, it means that everybody is is on a like for like basis then does that mean the bottom 25 percent are paying too much <laughs> but it certainly does indicate that doesn't it that uh, they certainly seem to be paying uh, a lot more than the, the top 25 percent I mean, the rental that's value. A, Sorry, David. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, thought there, because generally speaking, those who are uh, looking to increase their area and have a bigger area to farm over and therefore reduce their uh, uh, machinery and equipment cost on a per hectare basis would, in our experience in the borders here, would, would be paying more per hectare to rent in land. And so there's a there's a contraindication potentially between your rental value at the bottom 25% and your machinery and equipment uh, uh, thing. They're, they're not a comparable 25%, I would suggest. So that you might actually find that the, the guys who are paying more in rental value are actually in the blue box for machinery and equipment. 
Yes, uh, the, the the two bottom twenty fives might not be the same. Like so, just because you're bottom twenty five on rental value doesn't mean you're bottom yeah. twenty five on uh, yes. machinery and equipment. Uh, the same exactly. argument for finance as well, because you might be yes. heavily geared because you've just bought land. Mm. Yeah, you're right because it is ranked on net margin and, and not not cost. Um, yes, you you could have in the top twenty five percent a a cost say of total machinery equipment which is higher than the average uh, but because your overall net margin is is lower than the average you, you've achieved that top 25 percent performance mm. um, and certainly the some work um, I did recently looking at winter feed weeks specifically showed that actually there were growers in that top 25 percent who had higher than average machinery and equipment costs but what they also had was lower labor and mm. lower contracting costs so you know it, the, the higher machinery cost was 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 you know mitigated by the fact that they had lower and uh, and contracting costs whereas in the bottom 25 percent what they tend to have is high machinery costs high contracting costs and high labor costs altogether mm -hmm. so it's you know on the face of it it doesn't quite add up or make sense um if if you if you're trying to sort of find areas where you can make some cost efficiencies why would you have high machinery costs and high contracting costs and high labor costs? Mm. Yeah. Well, what that's saying, what, what we've got there, Mark, is really saying that, that you, you can't compare each of the, the uh, sectors that you've got along the bottom of your, uh, your slide here uh, with the next door one on, ex on the same basis, isn't it? So we can't say that the machinery, the, that somebody in the blue bar for machinery costs might well be the same person in the labour and in the rental. They, they they have to stand on their own, those things, don't they? They do. But but what it does highlight, David, is the aspects of your business where where we can focus to make the biggest mm -hmm. change. You know, so yes. Rental value is yes. pretty difficult to make a change, isn't it? Because if you want yeah. the land, you pay the money fairly yeah. simply. But, you know, labour costs, there's quite a difference there. And uh, obviously machinery, and, there's probably yeah. 120 pounds a hectare between top and bottom yeah. but it's interesting to see that fertilizers um crop protection and seed costs there's very not a lot of difference yeah and if it's a total variable it's even closer yeah yeah yes well if i go on to the next slide which is just bring up the spring barley cost productions this is, this is all spring barley and uh, yeah I, I think those differences certainly the machinery equipment and rental values again show up here there's, there's a huge range between the top and bottom isn't there Mm -hmm. So this is specifically at spring barley. Yeah. So generally we do see some some lower costs per hectare, of course, for, for spring barley than we do with, with winter wheat. Um, but the, I think the key thing uh, for those listening is that, you know, the, the trends are the same. You got the five big cost areas again of fertilizer, crop protection, labor, machinery and, and rental value. Um, but there is Certainly, with the machinery equipment, uh, you know, nearly a uh, hundred pound per hectare difference between the top and bottom, twenty-five percent. Yeah, and it, it is difficult. There are things, I suppose, that are immediately within control. You, you know, and there is a difference in the, you know, the the seeds, ferts, and sprays that, you know, probably ten, twenty, thirty pounds a hectare, which can make a difference to the bottom line, which is easily manageable. So, you know, it does have a look that the things that are easily manageable. Um, are on the left hand side and the ones to the right are more um, sort of longer term business uh, aspirations I suppose that are you know it's much more difficult to set a policy in but as long as you're aware you can you can start to make a difference to that. Yeah your feed fertilizer your seeds your your crop protection is, is fairly instant yep. you know it, it's, it's yearly whereas maybe machinery equipment labor is, is, is a long term change. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, what's the cost of not getting the crop in at the right time? You know, that's that's the bit you've got to weigh up. Certainly, you know, when we get to the extremes of weather, we've been seeing that, you know, weather does have an impact on um, cost as well. And, you know, you, you do have to be able to react to that. So, you know, it can be your land base uh, and your farming business. It's very difficult to, to analyse um, what you can change, but you have to be aware of it so that you know what to look at to change, you know, as we were discussing earlier, you know, a change to all spring cropping should see a slight reduction in costs, if, uh, which would be an interesting model to run um, of, of this in versus theory. In, in theory. theory. In theory. 
<laughs> we are in the theory room. I'll, I'll give you that one, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get rid of the combine because you're doing uh, spring cropping. You still need to cut the stuff. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yep. And an actual fact in that argument actually goes out the window with a combine because you want a bigger spread. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certainly, certainly up here, you know, you're limited to if you went all spring cropping for argument's sake, you're then limited to how much you can do in the weather window. Mm. So the, the bigger spread actually puts more hectares across your combine. Mm. So you know, it's a it's a balancing act. There's no there's no that's, easy answer. That's a ri- yeah, that's a risk management issue too, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I suppose you know we've got to look at in that you know the grain drying costs as well. You know the the combine capacity as we go further north is. Um, you know, it's quite a, a large one. You can see a two or three percent drop in grain moistures coming in uh, with the larger capacity combine. So, you know, we understand that, you know, combines get larger the further north you go as the window um, decreases. I, I think, Chris, you hit, hit the nail on the head actually earlier on in a comment is, is knowing some of these things, whether you can, uh, you know, it's knowing where the costs lie and knowing where the challenges are uh, as opposed to guessing. Um, yeah. You know whether you can actually physically do very much about it. Sometimes it's easier than others, but um, it's knowing where the costs lie. And you might well be heavy in some departments, but you know if you can justify it, you can justify it. Yeah, exactly. You know, thirty pounds, uh, you know, saving on fertilizer or crop protection is probably easier to do than a thirty pounds a hectare saving on labour and machinery. I would suggest <clears throat> they kind of are almost well, they are fixed, aren't they? Really, it's. Uh, You've got to analyse the business policy going forward. So it's knowing them. It's knowing them. It's having yeah. an understanding of wh- wh- why they are where they are. Yeah, exactly, exactly. J- just for sake of completeness, um, this is the winter oilseed rate cost production figures. Um, again, you can see it's a different crop, but the trends are are, are they similar? Uh, and again, um, significant differences in that top and bottom range for those machinery and and, and rental um, costs. Interesting. I thought we might have seen a, a bigger um, differential in the seed costs, uh, which was, you, you know, because seed rate and uh, whether you're home saved or bought in can make a, a huge difference mm. uh, to the seed costs, which we've certainly seen from, from Farm Bench. And uh, I think one of the bits that we point out from, from our groups is has been an interesting one to see, you know, your seed cost versus your yield. And then, of course, you ask the question, well, who's on double O or who's on high heuristic? And, you know, you can start, it's always a very good trend to, to pull out a farm bench, a very easy win. Um, you know, the higher seed cost does seem to take quite a bit of profit away very quickly. 